Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. I've titled today's message, Overcoming Despair. And I'm sure we would all agree this morning that every life is touched by despair. There's not a single person who is listening or watching me this morning who will argue that there's not been a time in your life where you found yourself in a situation, a circumstance where you are so overwhelmed by what was happening to you that you were not necessarily sure how you were going to be able to move past it or even resolve it. And whether despair comes to us by way of adversity, whether it comes to us by way of failure or disappointment, rejection, loss, or even opposition, there are times in life when a situation can become so daunting that in fact it paralyzes us. You agree? There are psychologists who suggest that whenever people experience what they consider to be a daunting situation or what I call a breaking point situation, something that leaves them feeling helpless, that leaves them feeling powerless, to resolve it, that they tend to express or to react in some of the following ways. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the ones that are the more common responses that people have. When people feel a sense of despair, there's that feeling of being weighed down by a sense of heaviness. Some people describe almost physically in a sense that there's just something sitting on their chest. And and in, in, in that regard, they feel exhausted. They feel like they feel unmotivated to do anything. Simplest tasks become difficult because there's no motivation to act. And there's some, because they're unmotivated to act, will choose to live in denial about the reality of the situation. If I pretend it's not happening, then I'll be fine. Or there's some that will bury themselves in unproductive, sometimes destructive behavior. Sometimes people will self-isolate from social interactions. All of this are mechanisms that people employ because they are trying to deal with something that they feel powerless to do something about. They want to be let out of what feels like a, a physical, emotional prison, and, and yet they, they find themselves unwilling and unable to do so. And a lot of times, valuable wasted time has gone by before the person realizes that all of the things they've been doing has done nothing to resolve the situation, and that in fact, with the passage of time, that the situation has probably even gotten worse. Maybe this was your experience in the past. So maybe you're going through a daunting circumstance now that causes you to feel despair, that causes you to be discouraged, to be worried. I want to leave you with you this morning good news. Everybody say good news. The good news is this, that while you and I may think that no one can fully understand what we are going through, while, while we, we may feel that people may not understand or relate to our experience, we can be confident this morning that Almighty God understands our struggle and that he is above all else able to minister to you and I in our place and point of need so that even what appears for the moment to be daunting, to be impossible, can become an opportunity for our faith and our dependence on him to be strengthened. In the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 19, we read the story about a prophet of God named Elijah. Elijah, the Bible says, reached a point of overwhelming despair, a breaking point moment in his life after he experienced a spiritual high point, not only for himself, but for an entire nation. Now, when you look in the preceding chapter, chapter 18, we read about a dramatic showdown that took place between Elijah, who was representing God, Jehovah, and on the other side, 450 no-name prophets who worshipped an idol named Baal. And the challenge was clear, that each side was to call on the name of their God, and that the God that answered by fire would demonstrate that he is God above above all else. And the scripture says that when Baal's 450 prophets called upon their God, <laughs> no surprise here, he didn't answer. But when Elijah called on the Lord, God's answer was immediate and God's answer was emphatic. And as a result, not only did the people of Israel turn their hearts to God in repentance, having rebelled against his rule for so many years, but also the scripture tells us all 450 prophets of Baal were executed. Now, not long after this happened, Scripture tells us that Elijah got a very threatening message from none other than the queen herself. Her name is Jezebel. In fact, that name scares me. <laughs> that name sounds very scary. But, but Elijah receives this message from this queen, and what she says to him is this, that what you have done to my priest, by this time tomorrow, you will be the same. And the Scripture says that something odd, something interesting happened. 
Now, of course, I can imagine Jezebel's frustration, right? Her idol. This is the God she'd introduced to Israel. He had been humiliated in front of the entire nation. Her priest had been executed. But you would have thought that this would have been a moment for the, for the prophet of God, having experienced this high point, this high moment in his life, to see the queen's words as empty, as meaningless, and yet his response to her was anything but courageous and bold. Verse 3 of 1 Kings 19 tells us that Elijah became very afraid. He became afraid. And he, in that moment, determined that the only response to this situation was for him to run for his life. Now, it is worth noting this morning that Elijah's response at that time, I believe, seemed like the right thing for him to do. If you were to ask him, why did you do what you did? He would have told you it made sense to him at the time. And the reason and the reality, friends, is this. It is no different from the reaction that people tend to have whenever we are confronted with a daunting situation. We make choices that, that in that moment seem to make sense. They seem to be right. And it's not, only, it's not until we've gone through a passage of time and we look back at that decision, we say to ourselves, why, why did I do that to begin with? That was a foolish decision. That was a foolish response. You know, if I had to do it over again, I would do it completely different. But in that point that he was, when he found himself in this impossible, seemingly impossible scenario, Elijah understood and felt like this was the only thing he could do. That running was the best idea in that moment. Now, of course, here's the thing. If Elijah's story had ended here, if Elijah's story had ended at this point, we would be justified in saying his life, his life story, his mission, his work could be associated as a failure or a disappointment. But I'm grateful that that's not where his story ends because this is where it starts to get better. God's response to his servant wasn't to turn against his servant, wasn't to swiftly reject him, wasn't to discount Elijah as a coward, as a, as a traitor. But what God does, the Bible says, is he ministers to his servant. He cares for Elijah. He, on two occasions, Scripture tells us in chapter 19, God provides food for Elijah to eat. Because God understood that Elijah needed to be nourished physically. He needed strength. And then I believe that it was God who led Elijah on what would be a 40-day trek to the wilderness where he would find himself at Mount Horeb. And that it was going to be here at Mount Horeb that God would once and for all address the root cause of Elijah's despair. And what do you think it was? I believe that the reason that Elijah despaired was because he had lost his focus and faith in God. This man who was able to stand before 450 prophets of Baal and to boldly and courageously stand for God in the, in the face of a, of a queen's threat had, had lost his focus on God. But I want you to notice in verse 9 what happens. When he comes to the mountain, God engages him. And this is what God says to him. Elijah came to a cave and he spent the night there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and God said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, note this morning that I believe that in asking his servant this question, God isn't focused on what Elijah is doing at Horeb as much as God wants to know, why are you at Horeb? So if we could rephrase that question, here's what I believe God was really asking Elijah. Elijah, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Here's the thing. Psychologists say that when people experience despair, it is usually because something crucial, something from which they gain stability, a sense of security, a sense of safety from, is missing. And so they're looking for something to fill that void. And so they make choices and they make decisions that they hope will resolve that despair that they feel. So God is saying to Elijah, Elijah, what are you looking for? You are here. Why are you here? What are you looking for? And what typically we do, again, is, as I said, when we, when we, can't, when we can't find a way to address that void, we, we make the decisions and choices that are sometimes destructive. For Elijah, it was obvious that he was missing the faith and focus on God that had served as anchors in his faith. Again, I take you back to what had happened in chapter 18. Elijah did not do what he was able to do because he was this strong man and he was, he was this confident and courageous man. No, everything he did, he did because God was working through him. And he learned the importance of trusting God, never, never, going, never, never going ahead of God, but allowing God to lead him and allowing God to use him. And in that moment, Elijah simply lost focus on God. But here's what I love about his story. Elijah learned that the only way that the despair in his heart, that chaos that was in his heart, could be quieted was for him to turn to God, to surrender fully to God, and to find in God what nothing and no one can give him. And two things this morning— one, the strength to endure, 
And the second thing, a renewed sense of purpose. Elijah needed strength to endure. And he needed purpose, a renewed sense of purpose. If there's one thing that I hope you will take away from today's message, I pray it's going to be this. That no matter what you are experiencing even now, that you may feel like it's causing you worry, anxiety, stress, you, you feel powerless to do something about If you and I will choose the route of trusting God, we'll choose the route of surrendering fully to him, that I believe that in doing so, God will give us the renewed strength that we need, the renewed sense of purpose that we need so we can continue to carry on. The presence of struggle, the presence of adversity does not mean that your life is over. It does not mean that God's purpose for you is finished. God's desire is for us to look to him, to call on him, and to trust that he will give us what we need. And so here's what I want to quickly do in these next few minutes. Share with you three things that I believe you and I can choose to do today. Whether we're going through adversity now or when adversity comes tomorrow. Three things that I believe we can do based on the story that we see Elijah experience. The first thing is we must remember that we are never alone in our struggle. When God asked Elijah, Elijah, why are you here? Elijah began to unload on God. Began to tell God all the things that were going wrong. And then he makes a statement. He says, God, I am all alone. There's nobody else. I'm left by myself. And the scripture tells us that God's response to Elijah wasn't to affirm that that idea that Elijah was by himself. Because God knew Elijah was not by himself. But God needed to bring Elijah to a place where he recognized that he was not alone in his struggle. But here's, here's the thing. Despair often makes us feel like nobody understands. Despair makes us feel like we're all alone, that nobody has gone through what we've gone through. Nobody has ever dealt with what we've dealt with or we're dealing with. Nobody has ever struggled the way we're struggling. And that nobody could possibly understand what we're going through. But that's really not the case. Psalm 23 verse 4 is a scripture we we recite over and over. But I want to focus on verse 4. The psalmist says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here's the thing. When you hear the word, you hear the phrase, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We think usually it simply means that a person is in the final, you know, the final moments of their life. Or we're talking about people who are experiencing, who've experienced a loss, a death in their their lives. But when you look at the Hebrew word word from which we get this phrase, shadow of death, it is samawet. And samawet is related to eyes heavy with weeping, distress, or gloom. And so what it does is it paints for us in a general sense this picture of gloom and doom that is often associated with difficult, daunting, and seemingly impossible circumstances. Again, every one of us have experienced a time in our lives where we found ourselves unable to deal with the situation that was in front of us, and we thought ourselves to be helpless and hopeless. But here the psalmist writes that he is able to walk through. Again, he's suggesting that It's not just the beginning of a situation, but he's able to walk through and to see the end of a situation. He says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I walk through difficult circumstances that have the potential to derail my faith, to derail my focus on God. I can walk through those circumstances. I can be confronted by evil and I can overcome. Why? Because God is with me. That no, one, no, matter, not, not, no matter what I go through, I'm experiencing that I can be confident that the Father is with me. The confidence that you and I have when we put our trust in our Heavenly Father, that no matter what we go through experience, that we can be confident that He is with us. God wants us to know He is with us. So here's the thing. Every single time you find yourself filled with worry, anxiety, fear, remind yourself, God is with me. I am not alone. God understands what I'm going through, and God will see me through. And in the same way that God reminded Elijah that there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee, In the same way, God wants us to remember today that we are never alone. He is with us. But just as God is with us, here's the other thing, friends. God has engrafted us into a body. We are part of a family. We are part of something that's bigger than our individual selves. So that even when we go through difficulties and struggles and trials, that there are people that God has raised in our lives, our our church family, the community of faith, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we can lean on for support and, and for comfort and for strength. Why? Because all of us recognize that because God is with us and because God comforts us, that we are then able to comfort others, even as he has comforted us in our own adversity. The second thing we must do this morning is choose to occupy ourselves with God rather than our struggle. 
Again, God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah begins to lament. And God's response to Elijah is very simple. God says to his servant, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Bible tells us that as Elijah stood watching, three things happened. A powerful destructive wind blew, followed by a raging earthquake, and then a raging fire. And whereas you would have thought, I guess Elijah may have thought that God would be in each of these powerful displays, he learned that God wasn't in, in, in any of them. Instead, God revealed himself to Elijah in a very simple, very soft way. Scripture says God spoke in a gentle whisper. Some translations use the phrase, a gentle breeze. But regardless of what it was, here's the thing, friends. It merely the prophet heard it. He recognized God was in it. So much so that he wrapped his face, Bible says, and he walked out into the middle of it. Because he understood that in this season of despair and struggle, that what he needed was to be totally immersed in the presence of God. That he needed to be reminded of the one he, have, he was called to serve, to allow his mind, his body and spirit to be saturated by, by God. And that's why I love what Paul says in Philippians 4. Paul is encouraging believers in times of adversity. He's saying to them that where it be easy for you and I to get wrapped up in our situation, our struggle, that our response should be in verse 4. He says, we are to rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because in verse 5 he says, the Lord is near. What Paul is talking about is presence. He's saying that when we go through adversity, God is with us. The comfort that we need, the comfort that we have will be provided when, when we recognize that God is the source of the peace that we need in those difficulties. And how we experience the peace of God, this is what verse 8 says, is we are to think continually. Some translations use the phrase, focus your thoughts on, or fill your minds with what? Things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Paul says, think about these things. There is no one, friends, who absolutely defines these characteristics more than God. What Paul is saying is fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him. Let him be the source of the peace that you seek. Where your hearts could be filled with despair, choose to fill it with the peace of God. Because there is only one God who is absolutely able to flood your heart with the peace that he seeks to give you. And here's the third and final point. We need to learn to trust God for the strength to pursue his purpose for us. Again, in verse 4, Scripture says, Elijah, having gone a day's journey, found himself in the wilderness. And the Scripture says, Elijah, listen to this. This is a man who, one chapter before, had led a great revival, a great spiritual awakening in his nation, was now saying to God, enough no, now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my fathers. If Elijah can experience that, who are we? The reality is that there are going to be times where we would despair to the point where we feel like I can't go on. God, you are finished with me. There's nothing you can do with my life. Elijah could have looked at himself and said, God, the fact that I could not stand up before a queen, a, a wicked woman, and, and, and stand up for you, God, I, I am useless to you. And how many times we've gone through something similar where we said to ourselves, God, I failed. God, I've disappointed you. God, I, I have not lived up to your, your, your standard or your, your expectation. And we discount ourselves. Why? Because of what we are going through. But the reality is, God is never finished with us. As long as there is breath in you, God's purpose for you still stands. And God wants you and I to realize that, yes, there are going to be times in our lives where we feel like our strength to keep pursuing God's purpose has been sapped dry and we have nothing else to give. That's when God says to us, look to me. I am the source because I am not finished with you. 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul described the thorn in his flesh, which he begged God to remove. Why would, do you think Paul would want God to remove that thorn from his side? I believe it's because the Apostle Paul saw that thorn and he saw that thorn as an impediment in his ability to do what God had called him to do. In fact, perhaps Paul was suggesting, God, if this stone is not removed from my, from my life, from my flesh, I cannot do what you've called me to do. But notice what God says to me in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul hears this. Paul says, you know what? I'm not worried anymore. The existence of that thorn in my side 
will not stop me from doing what God has called me to do because the purpose of God for my life is bigger than the adversity I face and the strength that God gives me will help me to move forward despite what is going on in my life. Paul says, I will boast about my weakness. Why? Because the power of Christ dwells in me. When the world looks at you, friends, no matter what you're dealing with, you're going to, you're struggling with, and they see you still walking with purpose, walk, walking with zeal, walking with joy, in spite of all the negatives that may be going in your life, and they wonder why, where are you even having the energy to do what you're doing, that you can point them to God and say, He gives me purpose. And no matter what's going on in my life, that purpose continues, and He will give me the strength to do what he's coming to do. God said to Elijah, you have work to do. Stop complaining. You have work to do. Look to me and do what I've called you to do. And praise the Lord, he finished the work that God had for him. I want to challenge you this morning with this very simple thought. Adversity will come. Jesus said in this world, we will have trouble. But he said, we take heart. Why? Because he has overcome for us. And that word overcome doesn't mean that he that the trouble disappears or that we never have to go through another adversity in our lives. Scripture says any, any man born of woman will face trouble. <laughs> Every man born of woman will face trouble. But we have confidence that we're not alone. We're confident that God gives us the strength and we're confident that his purpose will as long as we have breath in our bodies will continue until the day he says your work is done. It is time for you to come home. Trust God today with your struggle. Let him strengthen you. Let him renew your sense of purpose. God has a great work he wants to do in your life and in my life. And don't let adversity keep you from doing what God has called you to do. And if you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're watching and you don't have a relationship with Christ, I want you to know this morning God loves you. He loves you beyond a shadow of a doubt. And God's desire is that nothing would stand in the way of his love for you. And what did God do by demonstrating that love? He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. So that when we call on his name, he gives us joy. He gives us peace. He gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of calling. Why? Because we are his. We are his. And you can choose him today. You can choose to embrace Christ as your Savior and Lord today. By asking him to come into your heart, acknowledge your sin, ask him to forgive you of your sin. Acknowledge that what Christ did on the cross, he did, and that what he did was sufficient to pay for your sin. That it's not that he did it and then you have to not work to earn God's approval. No, that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sin. And that your commitment today is to open the door of your heart and say, God, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Live in me, live through me. Use me to do what you want to do. And God's invitation is to, that, is, is to all of us here today. But I want to again say, if you're struggling... If you're struggling, cry out to God. He wants to meet you in your place and point of need. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your word. The invitation that your word gives us, Lord, to turn to you, call on you, cry out to you, trust you. And God, I pray this morning, Lord, that as we consider, Father, our response, Lord, to the times of adversity that we face, Father, help us, Lord, to never forget that we are never alone that you're with us. Help us to always remember that, God, the strength we need, we'll find in you. And that, God, your purpose for us, Father, Father, remains. That, God, you who call, that, God, you will equip and enable us to do everything we need to do so we can accomplish the work you've set before us. And, God, for anyone that is here today who does not know Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord, I truly believe that even now that there are those who are calling on you, God, because they recognize I need you, God. I cannot live without you, God. Have your way in me today. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Change me. Live in me. Live through me, God. Thank you that, God, as they are crying out to you in faith, that, God, you have forgiven them as you promised in your word. That, God, as the word says, because they put their trust in the name of the Lord, they believe in his name, Father. You have given them the right to become children of God. We rejoice. We celebrate what you have done in this place. And, God, I thank you that the testimony of everyone here this morning will be this, that God is with me. That God is for me. That God is not finished with me yet. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Praise the Lord. Before we conclude this morning, we would like to be in today our first...